Morning, everybody. On that water baptism class, uh, just be clear that the slide says, I have decided, and I want to be clear about that. It is that you have decided to follow Jesus, that you've surrendered your life to Christ at some point. And if, you, if you've done that and you haven't been baptized in water, that is, um, that is the next step in your obedience to Jesus to tell the story of your being brought from death to life through water baptism. So that class will be helpful for you, but just, just keep in mind, it's about, it's about you being a follower of Jesus Christ, and if you've, made, if you've made that decision, then water baptism is next for you. And some of you have been following Jesus for a long time and you haven't been baptized in water, and um, now's the time. Quit goofing around. Jesus commanded it. And uh, you can go to that class and learn about it, but it's a, it's a step of obedience for you. Praise God. Um, okay, so 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're breaking into chapter 2 today. And um, most of you probably know that the Skagit County Fair was happening this week, Wednesday through Saturday. I think it just ended last night. And just out of curiosity, how many of you are fair goers? Very few. Wow. Interesting, right? I don't know. Maybe it's a something from a, a bygone era. Maybe it's a fun thing. I don't, I don't particularly like the fair. I have a very weak stomach for things like rides. I can get sick on a playground swing. <laughs> and so I don't like, I don't, I don't even, I can't even remember the last time I went to the fair. But um, uh, so when we talk about the county fair, a lot of times you hear people say, I went to the fair as if it was just this single momentary thing that they did. But, but we know if we've been to the fair that it's actually a multi-day, multifaceted event. It's some, there's, there's lots of, there's the rides for sure, but then there's all the fair food and then there's the farm stuff and then the carnival games. There's, there's lots of different aspects to the fair and it takes place over the course of m multiple days. So as we've been studying in these letters to the Thessalonians, um, there's, uh, uh, there, there's several kind of themes, but one of the dominant themes is the Apostle Paul is writing under the Spirit's inspiration to this church to help them understand because they had had some errant teaching, some errant information regarding the coming of Jesus Christ and uh, what we call the day of the Lord. And so Paul is writing to them. Last week, we got a, a, a huge uh, understanding from, first, from the first chapter. This week, we break into the second chapter, and again, we carry this, this theme on. And though we can think of the, like back to the county fair, though we can think of that as like this single event, we know that it's a, a multi-day, multifaceted event. And when we study scripture, we, sometimes we think of the day of the Lord as if it were a momentary event, something that takes place with the snap of the finger, fingers, or, um, or that it's just this, you know, this uh, like almost like a 24, literal 24 hour period of time. But that's not how the Bible portrays it. The Bible portrays it, tells us that this thing that we know as the day of the Lord is actually um, not a multi-day, but rather a multi-year event, and it is multifaceted. And so we're learning about this as we continue on in chapter 2. In our text today, it's called the day of the Lord, but then later in the text, it's summarized simply as that day. And uh, we want to capitalize the word day there because of its, um, because of its significance. So we're, we're going to learn more about that day today. But, but those of you that are a part of the City Point Church family, you know that, that we, just, we teach through the Bible. And, um, and this year, kind of interestingly enough, we have been taking in an, a significant amount of teaching from the Bible with regard to kind of the end time stuff, and, and it isn't like we've done a study on the end times, but we studied through the Gospel of Matthew, and last earlier this year we were, we were in Matthew 24 and 25, which contains uh, a, a vast amount of 
of Jesus' own teachings on the end times. And uh, you can find that, that teaching online in our YouTube page or um, our YouTube channel or, or uh, I think on our website. If you're interested in that and you didn't get to hear it, and of course, First and Second Thessalonians it contains a great deal more. And today we're going to learn even more. And, you know, it's like warning. This is a, these, are, these are challenging texts. Um, they're, they're challenging texts to exposit and to proclaim, but they're challenging to take in. And uh, so Proverbs 16.20 says this, He who gives thought to the word will discover good. So this morning, as students of the Bible, let's give thought to the word and trust that God's going to help us to discover good. All right? So let's read our text. It's verses 1 through 12. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed, either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed." the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? And you know what is restraining him now so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. The coming of a lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We better pray, huh? Let's pray to God. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. And we trust that you're going to, um, as we give thought to it, we trust that you're going to help us to discover good. Lead us in truth today. Help us to love the truth today, Lord. Give us ears to hear and hearts to receive. May your Holy Spirit bring proper um, understanding and conviction. I pray, God, for particularly for those who don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that this day that you would capture their hearts and they would come to love God and follow Jesus. Praise your name. Amen. So I'm going to give you the big idea up front, and then we're going to work through the text. But as you can see, uh, pretty massive text, these 12 verses. And uh, when we talk about the big idea, we're talking about what's what's the essence of the text. If we could boil it down to a simple sentence that maybe we can remember, what is the, what's the, what's this text leading us to? And our big idea this morning is this, that submission to Christ is the only way to avoid the deception of Antichrist. Submission to Christ is the only way to avoid deception of Antichrist. And we get a lot of details with regard to end time stuff. But if we were to say, what's the essence of these 12 verses, this section? I think that big idea is helpful. That if we we are not submitted to Jesus Christ, then we will be deceived on that day by Antichrist. And it's a, it, that's a definitive statement. I recognize that. It does not leave any wiggle room, but I think just by reading the text, we can see that it, the text itself doesn't really give us any wiggle room. So we need to understand for sure what's taking place. So let's study through this text. Now, uh, we got two characters listed in the big idea, Christ and Antichrist. So it's important before we even get into the text that we define who these characters are. The first one, Christ, no surprise to probably most of us, is the divine son of God. 
whose sacrificial death and resurrection secured salvation for all who believe in him. He is the Savior. He is the one who saves us from our sins, delivers us from condemnation, and gifts us with eternal life by the grace of God. Antichrist is that end-time person who opposes Christ and deceives the world. In our text, he's called the man of lawlessness, the one who functions as if he is a law unto himself. He is a counterfeit savior. We're going to see in the text that this is a a world ruler who will arise at some point in history and will deceive the world to their condemnation. So let's go back to the beginning and let's see about that day. That day, we're told right off the bat, is coming, but it hasn't come yet. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him. The apostle addressed the coming of the Lord in chapter 1. If you're with us in the study through 1 Thessalonians, you know that he did so also in chapter 4 of that chapter and chapter 5. Now, as we get into this second chapter in this letter, he begins to address a particular and concerning issue. Someone has disturbed the church with false teaching, saying that the day of the Lord has already begun. And Paul says concerning this, Don't be quickly shaken. Don't be alarmed. And then he lists these three things. By a spirit, meaning somebody misusing or pretending to exercise a spiritual gift. By a spoken word, a particular teaching that would be, in what Paul is saying, would be a false teaching. Or a letter seeming to be from us. Somebody forging, writing a letter and forging the apostle's signature saying, this is from the apostle Paul, and he has said the day of the Lord has begun. Recall the church of the Thessalonians is suffering severely. They are suffering under the wrath of man. The persecution is so severe, and this false teaching is coming in and saying, because you're suffering the way you're suffering, it's because the day of the Lord has already begun. Paul says no. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, don't be quickly shaken. That false teaching is, um, that teaching is false, he says. So when he says this, the coming of the Lord and our being gathered to him, it's a two-sided event. We learn from 1 Thessalonians 4 that when Jesus comes, he will gather his people to himself. Chapter 4, verse 13 through 18. When Jesus descends from heaven, the church meets him in the air. And at that moment, the church, those who are followers of Jesus Christ, experience immediate relief from all of life's woes. And they experience instantaneous glorification. We studied that. That comes out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. The mortal puts on immortality. The corruptible puts on incorruption in the twinkling of an eye. Upon Jesus returning, that all happens instantaneously. That is the beginning of this multifaceted, multi-year event known as the day of the Lord. Jesus will gather his people to himself. It's the beginning of what we learned last week, the righteous judgment of God. If you remember from last week, Jesus relieves his people at that moment. of their their suffering, all of life's woes. And the reason for that first side of the the event, it's a double-sided, two-sided event, the reason for the first side is because of the second side. The second side is that Jesus is coming to punish the world for sin. It's a little different picture than we get of the Lord Jesus. Sometimes in this world, we get this picture of Jesus as if he were this kindergarten teacher who says, okay, children, 
let's sit down, crisscross applesauce. Let's do this now. Come on. That's, that's kind of the picture we get of Jesus. But when we read the Bible, we do actually get a little different side of that. See, he gathers his people to himself. And then we're told that he begins to punish the world. And it is punitive for their sin. It's not rehabilitation time. It's punitive. And that's hard for us to swallow. If there's a time to be rehabilitated, it'd be right now. But on that day, it's going to be different. This is the other side of the righteous judgment of God that we studied last week, where Jesus comes to inflict vengeance on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. The gathering of the church is the trigger point for the seven-year, what we know as the Great Tribulation which in summary is God punishing the world for their brazen refusal to live life the way he has designed it to be lived. And the church is not present on earth at this time. Some of you wonder about that. We've studied this. That's a, that's a great, great um, kind of end times topic. Is the church present during the great tribulation? And I think as we've studied the text in Matthew, as we've studied First and Second Thessalonians, Think about it. And, and again, maybe my arguments will not persuade you. I think the arguments can be made in the other directions as well, but I believe that the church is not present on earth because of the context of what's actually taking place. The wrath of God is being poured out, which 1 Thessalonians 5 specifically says we are not destined for. We don't participate in that. If when Jesus returns, we're promised immediate relief and instant glorification and told explicitly that we're not destined for wrath, how could we be present? We're not. It's a two-sided event. Now, that day is coming, but it hasn't yet come. And when we misunderstand that day, it's upsetting. This is what's going on with the church of the Thessalonians. They have been shaken, he says. Not, we don't want you to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. To be quickly shaken. You hear something that's not true, but you think it's true. It can be very upsetting. Have you ever been on a tall ladder and had the ladder f- start to fall? And that, that sense of fear and, and all of the anxiety and all the adrenaline that runs through your system so fast, that's kind of a description what he's saying. The church of the Thessalonians, because of the suffering that they're enduring, are being told, you missed it. Jesus is coming. You missed it. And they're like quickly shaken. And Paul writes to them and says, don't, don't be. It hasn't begun yet. And that was true then, and it's certainly true now as well. That day is coming, but it hasn't come yet for us either. And so his last admonition here, before he begins to get into the teaching of the details, is let no one deceive you in any way. That's a strict admonition. That is a very sincere admonition. It comes to us by way of not just an encouragement. It's actually, it's actually much more like a commandment from somebody who cares deeply for us. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way. Now, the, o- the only real way to not be deceived is to be a very thorough student of the Bible, to be a part of a church, a local church, that is adamant about teaching the Bible. Believers are warned, don't be deceived. Guard against being deceived. Now, we've got to get into the, the, the actual details here. Second half of verse 3, where he begins and says, That day, the day of the Lord, will not come unless... And then he tells us of two events that indicate that that day has begun. Right? Now, these two events are part of the day of the Lord, they're not prior to the day of the Lord. They're not precursors to the day of the Lord. Paul's argument here is when the world sees these two events taking place, the world can be sure that the day of the Lord has begun. He uses this knowledge to assure the church that they haven't missed the gathering of the believers because these two events aren't yet taking place. That day will not come unless, first he says, 
the rebellion comes first. Second, the man of lawlessness is revealed. So there's going to be this global apostasy, here translated rebellion, but it's where we get the word, the word apostasy. An apostate is someone who abandons their faith in God. So who is this group of people? There's going to be this massive rebellion that takes place, the huge falling away, an apostasy that takes place on earth. Who are these people? Now, it's called a rebellion because to abandon one's faith is not... This, is, this might be one of the most important parts of this whole message. To abandon one's faith is not just to turn from God. It's to turn on God. It's not just to say, I'm going to give God my back. Nobody actually does that. They think they're doing that, but nobody actually does that. You don't turn from God, you actually turn on Him. That's why it's translated a rebellion. It's not, I don't want to have anything else to do with you, God, and walking this way. It's to turn from God and say, I'll fight you. That's what this apostasy is. That's in keeping with Jesus, what, what Jesus said, that there isn't actually any neutral ground regarding him. He said, you're either for me or against me. And there's a lot of people who are not for Jesus who would not think of themselves as being against him. But in fact, they are. And in this global apostasy that takes place, it'll become more and more clear. There are people who think they're turning from God, but what they're actually going to do by aligning themselves with Antichrist is they're going to turn on God. So who is this group of people? Well, it's not a general rebellion against God. The world has been in that state since Adam and Eve. The world has been in this general state of rebellion against God from the very, from the very beginning, from the first sin. So it's not just a general rebellion. I assure you, friends, it is not a falling away of true Christ followers. Jesus said that he would not lose any whom the Father had given to him. So those who are truly surrendered to Jesus Christ, they can truly say, Jesus is my Lord and he is my Savior and I have been born again and I belong to him. You need not be troubled. You're not going to be a part of the apostasy. This is a group of people who actually believe in God, but they reject Him. They, they're people who have never truly submitted to Jesus, but they believe in God. You know people like that. I know a mountain of people like that. Oh, I believe in God. But, but they're, they've never experienced what Jesus called being born again. They've never been transformed by the grace of God. They're not truly submitted to Jesus. They just believe in God. It's a huge amount of people in this world. And this is a rejection of God by those who claim to believe in God. That's what this apostasy is. The second event that takes place relatively simultaneous is the rise of Antichrist. In our text, he's called the man of lawlessness, the son of or the one destined to destruction. The apostle John calls him Antichrist. He's also likely, I use that word likely, the second beast that's described in Revelation 13 and 17, all this great imagery in Revelation. And we notice that he will not just oppose the Christian faith, he actually oppose all faiths, exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. This is his proclamation. This world leader rises to such power and prominence that he will oppose all religions, all faiths, including the Christian faith, and he will declare himself to be God. We're told that he takes his seat in the temple of God and makes this claim. 
He takes his seat in the temple of, in the Jewish mindset, the temple of the one true God, and he puts down all faiths and says, I am the only God. This is an act of desecration, of course. It seems to fit the timeline in the book, in the book of Daniel, of Daniel's 70th week, for those of you that are s- students of this sort of thing. So this timeline of things taking place, it seems to be, it takes place about halfway through Daniel's 70th week, da- Daniel chapter 9. Also, what's written in Daniel 9 and Daniel 11, as well as what Jesus said and recorded in Matthew 24 and Mark 13, seems to demand, notice my language, there's some things here that, are, that we can be very dogmatic about and other things I use words like likely and seems because we can't be overly dogmatic about it. But it seems like what's said here coinciding with what Daniel 9 and 11 and Matthew 24 and Mark 13 say demands that an actual physical temple would exist in Jerusalem at that time, a temple that does not exist at this moment possibly something that would be constructed during the first half of those, that 70th week, the first half of what we know as the Great Tribulation. More on that shortly. But we've got these two events that indicate that that day has begun. We know it hasn't begun yet. And when these two events are seen, are witnessed, then you know it has begun. That's what we're told. Now it's clear that this is content that the Apostle Paul has covered with the church of the Thessalonians when he was with them. Look again at verse 5. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? So up to this point, this has all been review for them. They have forgotten the sound teaching that Paul had given to them while he was with them. And now he's having to remind them. Don't you remember this, he says? We covered this material. Let's go on to verses 6 through 12, last part of our text. What we see here then is that when that day begins, destinies are sealed. Fates are set, if you will. He says, and you know what is restraining him now. Talking about the man of lawlessness. You know what is restraining him now. So that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it will do so until he is out of the way. Boy, this is interesting, isn't it? So there's this present delay to the rise of Antichrist. When that day begins, there's going to be a sealing of destinies, including that of the Antichrist, but there's this present delay. Verse 6 begins, and you know what is restraining him. Remember, he's talking to them, writing to them about things that he'd already covered. So they know he's told them what it is that's restraining Antichrist at that moment. Problem is, we don't know. <laughs> he, told, he tells them, and you know what it is, but he doesn't, he doesn't say, and remember, this is what I said. And he doesn't write that down, so we don't know. We're left to try to figure it out. What is actually restraining Antichrist, the man of lawlessness. We, we, don't, we don't know. There's lots of speculation. Something or someone is keeping Antichrist from appearing. And that's kind of how we have to say it because look at the text. It's not super clear. In verse 6, it says, and you know what is restraining him. So the hymn is the Antichrist and something is restraining him. But when you get into verse 7, the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains it. So what's restraining the mystery of lawlessness is a he, not a what. It's a who. Interesting, right? So something or someone, that's how we have to say it. And it's Lots of speculation throughout church history. Is it civil government? Certainly civil government does restrain lawlessness. We know that. But is that what's in play here? Is that what's keeping? Is civil government what's keeping the man of lawlessness from revealing himself prematurely? Nothing nothing is happening outside of God's sovereign control. We can tell that in the reading of this text. Civil government. Some say it's the church. 
Others say, based on Daniel 12, that it's the angel, uh, the archangel Michael. Some say it's the Holy Spirit. I would say the most appealing argument in all of this is that it is the Holy Spirit who is restraining Antichrist, and it's specifically the Spirit's present at work in and through the church that's restraining complete lawlessness. The church being the salt of the earth and the light of the world, the Spirit of God working in and through the church is what is keeping the man of lawlessness from revealing himself. But when the church is removed at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, then the ministry of the Spirit on earth will, if you will, be much more like the way he operated on earth during the Old Testament times. And when that happens, the man of lawlessness and lawlessness in general will be unrestrained. But whatever or whoever it is, he or it is effectively holding back this son of destruction until God's time is right. Aren't you glad for that? When that day begins, destinies are sealed. There is a present delay to the rise of Antichrist. The influence, though, of Antichrist is already being felt. The mystery of lawlessness, he says, is already at work. That was true when this letter was written nearly 2,000 years ago. It's most certainly true today. It certainly seems like all we have to do is look at the headlines in the news just about any given day and see that, that lawlessness Is, rem is remarkably evident in the hearts of human beings. It's, it's, a, it's a marvel, isn't it? Things like these smash and grab robberies. Like, that's lawlessness. That's just evidence of... Un it's, not a, it's being restrained to a degree, but it's already at work. Lawlessness in the hearts of human beings. Acts of terror corrupt politicians who act as if they're a law unto themselves, rebellion against all sorts of authority. Truth is, anytime we are, anytime we give ourselves to doing something that's illegal, either illegal by our civic laws or illegal by the law of God, we're, being, we're actually being influenced by this mystery of lawlessness. It's the spirit of Antichrist. We know that as that day approaches, there's going to be this growing anti-God sentiment brewing on earth prior to the revealing of the man of lawlessness, and he's going to capitalize on that. And we're told in the right time, verse 8, Jesus will kill and condemn Antichrist. So, Watch, look at verse 8. Let's look at this carefully. So he's being restrained in verses 6 and 7. And in verse 8, then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. Remember, we're talking about destinies being sealed. But when we read verse 8, it kind of seems like Jesus comes and kills the man of lawlessness at the very moment that he's revealed. But other passages of Scripture describe a period of time in which he leads and deceives the world. So we've got to strive to put this together in a way that there's a faithful timeline from the multitude of Scriptures that address the coming of the Lord. And it seems like the man of lawlessness is revealed and wreaks havoc on earth for at least 42 months, three and a half years, the second half of the seven-year tribulation. And at that time, then, he musters an army and attempts to wage war against Jesus. And verse 8 tells us that he's unsuccessful. Subsequently, according to Revelation 19 and Revelation 20, he is thrown into the lake that burns with fire 
where he will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Jesus will kill and condemn Antichrist. In the meantime, Antichrist deceives the world. So when the day of the Lord begins, the church is gathered to be with the Lord. God begins to punish the world for its rebellion against him. Antichrist rises, begins his influence on a global scale. Jesus at some point, roughly, is going to come roughly three and a half, maybe seven years. He's going to come back and put an end to all that. But in the meantime, during that period of time, we get this fuller description in verses 9 and 10 of what's taking place. How is it that he's effectively deceiving the world? Verse 9 says the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan. He operates under the influence of, he's empowered by the devil with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception. It's the activity of Satan. He is the father of lies. We know that. So he's going to lie to the world through the activity of Satan with this power, false signs and wonders, and wicked deception. Remember, Antichrist is a counterfeit savior. He's going to appear to be A great savior, likely making all sorts of peace treaties and bringing countries together who have been been at odds with each other. He's somehow going to bring, remember when we learned from 1 Thessalonians, people are going to be saying peace and then sudden destruction. Remember? This is what's taking place here. He's deceiving the world, creating uh, this sense of, of, of peace, false peace. Now remember when Jesus came, He authenticated his ministry with signs and wonders. So in acts of kindness and love toward human beings, he brought healing to them, he fed them, he revealed his power, showing that he is the Savior, the Christ. So when Antichrist comes, he's going to deceive people with these pseudo signs and wonders. And the rest of verse 10 tells us why people are swayed by him. It says that he's able to deceive those who are perishing. That's a key phrase. He's able to deceive those who are perishing because they, those who are perishing, refused, past tense, refused to love the truth and so be saved. So the Antichrist, remember this apostasy apostasy that's going to take place, People who say they believe in God but have never submitted to Jesus will be those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. It's a parallel passage to what we saw last week about those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a refusal to love the truth and so be saved. To love the truth would be to be saved. But to refuse to love the truth is to perish. It is to be deceived and to perish. And we're told that the world will perish for refusing the truth. Those under the lawless one's deceptive power are so because they refuse to love the gospel, the truth. And of course, that's why they're perishing. Sometimes again, we think we can stand on neutral ground here, but there is no neutral ground here. If we love the truth, then we're not perishing. We're being saved. But if we refuse to love the truth, we will perish. We will not be saved. By default, to refuse the gospel is to believe what is false and so be condemned. Those in this condition are powerless against the sway of Antichrist. There's a logical sequence here. Indifference toward the gospel will turn into deception by Antichrist. And then open rebellion against God. Remember, to turn away from God isn't actually true. You turn on God. And then condemnation. And that gets us back to our big idea. Submission to Christ is the only way to avoid the deception of Antichrist. True Submission to Jesus 
It's the only way to avoid being deceived and thus condemned. So when the Bible states that today is the day of salvation, it isn't an idle statement. God's grace and his mercy are extended today. Today we have verses like John 3.16, that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Likely the most familiar verse in all of the Bible that does a very fine job, the very words of Jesus Christ, a very fine job encapsulating what it means to know God and obey the gospel, to love the truth and so be saved. Today we have verses like that because God is not willing that any would perish. Today we have verses like 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness. The promise there that the Apostle Peter is referring to is the return of the Lord. But he is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. This is the heart of God. This is the long-suffering of God. Loving, long-suffering not wanting any to perish, all to reach repentance, all to believe in Jesus and thus have eternal life. Today, we have verses like that. But on that day, on the day of the Lord, verses 11 and 12 of our text come into play. Those verses show us that during the rebellion, that apostasy, those who have rejected the truth will give their allegiance to the lawless one. And they will be sent, notice, a strong delusion by God. Their sinful choice to reject God in this life and take pleasure in unrighteousness has grim and logical consequences. There is a point, friends, where people's rejection of the truth turns into their sealed condemnation. And that's sobering. Now there's an indication from other passages of Scripture that there will actually be a multitude of people who are saved during the Great Tribulation. They'll be saved through that terrible time. But our text makes it clear that it won't be any who have previously heard and rejected the gospel. Today is the day of salvation. Submission to Christ. It's sobering, isn't it? In some ways, it's scary. If you are a follower of Christ, it's You're not scared for yourself. We've already established. If you've truly submitted to Christ, you need not be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed. Don't let anyone deceive you. You belong to Jesus, and he's coming for you. The scary part is for those that we care deeply about, that are not submitted to Jesus. And for you who aren't followers, a follower of Christ, I I don't say this lightly, you should be scared. This isn't a turn or burn message. This is just a teaching straight out of the Bible. I'm not sweating and pounding the pulpit and yelling at you. But you should know based on what we've looked at from the Bible today, that God is not kidding. He has provided in his incredible graciousness a way of escape. He's provided a great salvation. His mercy is remarkable. But that's for today. We have no idea when Jesus is coming back. 
Those who say they do are lying to you. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way. But when he comes back, when he comes back, he's taking those who belong to him with him. And those who have heard the gospel but have refused to love the truth will perish. Others who at that point hadn't heard the gospel, I think there's evidence in Scripture that there's going to be a lot of evangel- evangelical work taking place, evangelism taking place, and the gospel being spread. And many will be saved through that time. But according to this passage, it doesn't appear that any who have heard the gospel and rejected it will be saved at that time. So I'd like to pray, and I'd like to pray specifically for those of you who don't know Jesus as your Savior. This is for those of you who are listening online. Some of you are going to be listening to this by way of a recording. And it pertains to you as well, and it includes obviously people in this auditorium. Let's bow our heads and consider the seriousness of the moment as well as the kindness of God. Today is the day of salvation. God loves you. And he has provided and the means by which you can be forgiven and reconciled to him. Please don't let this day pass. Please don't let God's invitation be sloughed off. Put your trust in Jesus today. If you would like to do that, I'm not going to call attention to you or draw, your, draw attention to you out of the congregation, but if, if today is the day where you say, I, I need to put my trust in Jesus, I want God's forgiveness, would you raise up your hand so I can pray for you? Yes. Let today be the day, yes. It's not enough to say, I believe in God. It's time to submit to Jesus. It's time to take God at his word and receive the Savior that he's provided. Anyone else before I pray? Those of you that raise your hands, I'd love to talk with you after. You can talk with any, any of our pastors or elders, but I'd like to pray for you. Let this be your prayer today. God, thank you for loving me. Have mercy upon me, God. Forgive me. Thank you for Jesus. I put my trust in him that he died for my sins and came back to life, conquering my enemies. I put my trust in Jesus. God, help me to learn to follow Jesus from this day forward. I belong to you, Lord, because your word tells me that if I call upon your name, I will be saved. Amen. Amen. It's a challenging passage of scripture, isn't it? It's like we look at it and get to the end in this moment where we go, okay, how do we apply this? We've got to trust God to help us to apply this. It's like, well, I could come up with all sorts of things. I'm going to treat my wife better. I'm going to treat my parents better. I'm going to treat my kids better. I'm going to, like, better, better, better. I want to, I want to, I want to love God and follow Jesus. But maybe doing part, partly what you're doing is, is like the way to live out what this passage is telling us. Let no one deceive you. Be a student of the Bible. Some of you are great students of the Bible and you've studied in particular this end times business and you're so intrigued and so curious about it. And you say, well, I I disagree a little bit with Brent. Go ahead, that's okay. You can't disagree with the premise though because we're solidly on the premise of submission to Jesus. Like that's, if we're Christians, we agree there. We may not be in agreement with the timeline. That's all right, right? God knows. 
But following Jesus, shoulder to shoulder, being s- submitted to the Bible, that's, that's where we, we're on solid ground, friends. I guess my challenge in making application is to wonder if, uh, if maybe there's people that you would say, man, I know they're, ah, you know how it is. We, we love them. They're good people. They want to do good. They want to do right. They believe in God, but they're not submitted to Jesus. Maybe, maybe you should have them listen to this sermon because we want them to be saved. We want them to not refuse the truth, but to love the truth. So that might be a way to respond. Let's pray together. Great is your name, God, in all of the earth. And as we bow before you this day, we're, your word is convicting and it's um, intriguing and it's life-giving, but is also heavy, Lord. And I pray for those who are hearing this message, that for those who are Christians, Lord, that they would take heart and know, God, that you are at work. You are working out your sovereign plan and nothing is going to thwart that. And we belong to you. And oh God, for those who don't know you, who have not submitted to Jesus, let them do so, Lord. Help us to be a part of your work in their lives. We love you, Lord. Receive our praise now. In Jesus' name, amen.